We are actually going to speak about uh, how open source models are, um, in a way, going out from the software, purely software realm. And exactly this talk, uh, it's about how open is getting real. Uh, first, first of all, I would like to, in to introduce myself. Um, I'm inside a lot of uh, s several different, <laughs> maybe too much actually, uh, things. Um, most of them are related to uh, openness and collaborative uh, models. Uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that I'm uh, also uh, co-chairing the uh, Open Source Hardware Summit that it's the most important uh, conference on open source hardware uh, coming up in September in Rome uh, for the first time. Uh, we'll be doing this uh, during the Innovation Week in Rome that will end with the Maker Fair. So if you are interested in open hardware, you should look into, uh, into this because it's uh, very interesting. It will be the first time in, in Europe. So, Basically, as you, um, as you probably already know, um, we are living a um, moment in which uh, most of the, t the enablers for digital innovation are uh, falling down in terms of cost and uh, everything is getting really um, accessible. And I particularly love the, uh, this, uh, the vision from John, John Agel. I really suggest you to check uh, his blog. Uh, he's the director of uh, innovation for uh, Deloitte uh, in, in San Francisco. And uh, basically, very recently, he pointed out uh, how all these uh, enablers that we, that we use to, to create digital innovations like bandwidth uh, or storage cost and, and, and compu computing, they are all going down uh, very fast and uh, will not likely stop uh, the trend uh, very soon. So what's happening actually is that uh, digital is componentizing. Um, as you may know, componentization is a very well-known uh, process that happens in mostly all industries, and it's uh, mostly due to the competition in industries. So if you have uh, several players competing for uh, user, for actual user, and uh, for suppliers, uh, what, what, what happens is, is actually that leaders in the market they push prices very down and make it possible for uh, newcomers to, to jump in a market. And so all this makes price go down and makes actually every market more democratic uh, and more accessible within time. So we have seen this with software a lot. As you know, open source is, uh, with open source software right now, you can enter the software market very soon and very easily. And this is happening also in hardware. Because basically, as uh, Mark Anderson said very uh, clearly, uh, software is eating the world. And so what's, what, what, what are we going to see in hardware? Um, you probably know this is a wrap wrap, uh, but also hardware is um, depending on very similar processes and enablers as software. Uh, we now have uh, uh, open platforms, both in software and hardware. We have everything as a service. Uh, we have uh, collaborative platforms that are free to use and uh, computing everywhere. So all the costs related to creating something new, uh, independently if this is software or hardware, these costs are going down very fast, as said. And on top of this, we have, uh, uh, thanks to the tools, we have uh, global cooperation uh, very easily. I, you know, I work in, in several projects, and most of them are run uh, around some Facebook groups, in a way. So it's, everything is free. You can collaborate massively with lots of people very easily, actually. And on top of, uh, of that, uh, for what regards hardware, we are, we are seeing the growth of global services that can, um, that can help uh, make hardware, make the, the process of doing hardware uh, easy, uh, as easy as software in a way. So mostly, uh, here you can see this is Alibaba. It's a, a platform where you can ask for Chinese, mostly Chinese suppliers to give you um, uh, offers 
uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe you need a piece of metal that is made a sh uh, star shape piece of metal, I don't know, just saying. And you, you go to the, to the um, portal and you ask, and you, re you can receive uh, tens of pro proposals in terms of price from tens of different suppliers in China. So that's, that's how people make like open source 3D printers and things like that. They just go there and ask for suppliers to, pro to propose prices for what they need. And this is accessible uh, mostly everywhere in the world. And if you also think that we have uh, massively um, available logistics like DHL or other couriers, you can create your business very easily. You can ask for, uh, once you have the design, you can go to Alibaba, you can get, ask for the uh, Chinese suppliers to send you the, the price uh, for, for what you need. You get the, the supply, you, you put together the stuff, maybe you just create a kit, and you distribute this uh, worldwide with um, global uh, logistics. It's perfectly feasible, you just need a place where you can uh, store the thing and m maybe put together the kits and you are on, the, on a business, so it's very easy. Uh, it's so easy that if you look at RepRap, in the last um, five years, if not wrong, or maybe a little bit more, we have seen like hundreds of different models and most of these models, um, they are targeting a specific niche uh, maybe, I don't know, one creator created one 3D printer and sell, sold that to, I don't know, maybe tens of hundreds of persons. And as you can see, this made the, uh, uh, I would say, the tree of possible uh, interpretation of RepRap so wide that you, you have hundreds of different models right now, all based on, on RepRap, that is the, the ancestor of all open source 3D printers. But uh, just to give you an idea of how tangible is it, uh, I'm working with these guys from Open Electronics. They created this 3 drug uh, printer and was created in Gallarate. There is um, a small town in northern Italy. And it's completely open source. It's GPL licensed. And um, it's based on RepRap. And actually, after uh, an agreement they had with uh, Belleman, that is um, a very big Belgian distributor, uh, they industrialized a little bit the printer and actually they have been able to sell more than 10,000 uh, printers all over the world. So you can have a huge impact uh, thanks to open source hardware right now. You can make big numbers. This is just an example, but the, the market is full of, of such uh, products. Um, so 3D printing is, is like a flagship representative of the open source hardware community. And it's really impressive how wide 3D printing has gone in, in the last few years. These are the guys from Amsterdam that they are working on, on a 3D printer that is uh, as big as a room and actually can build a house in terms of uh, architectural elements that you can put together. Um, that's the last, uh, um, the last exam um, I don't know how to say, the last version. There is a video, but I will not click it because we don't have much time and I would like to take some questions. So uh, you can check it on the internet. It's very cool. This printer is huge. Um, and maybe there's something even bigger. Uh, these guys from, these are Chinese guys that uh, like one month ago, they, they just built like five houses like this overnight with a concrete uh, printer. So things are moving very fast. Uh, on top of this, also open design, it's, it's catching up with, uh, with uh, the new techniques of fabrication. You, here you can see an interesting project that is called Wiki House. It's from an English uh, designer that's building an open source framework for, for housing. Uh, you can actually download all the design from, from the web and you can um, uh, cut, laser cut or just CNC, with a with CNC router you can cut the wood and you can put together and you can create your own house very easily. Obviously, you, maybe you, you can then put some effort to make it uh, a little bit more resistant, but uh, the base is very cool and uh, modular and open source. I have a video to show you. Maybe I will try to show you this because it's pretty cool. This is a workshop that we had at the Wisher Fest last year. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's see if I can make it work. Yeah, I think so. 
uh, as you can see, building these, uh, these things is not that complex. You can do that very easily just with a, with a wooden, um, I don't know how to say, hammers. It, you don't need any screw or particular tool. You just put things together and you, you do like Legos. And uh, that was built in an afternoon, actually. It's just a demonstrator. Uh, but it's, you know, you know, it's really cool. And this was built during a set, during the Wisher Fest, that is uh, the biggest uh, festival about the collaborative economy that happens every year in Paris. And I'm part of that. So just to get back to the presentation, um, that's what's happening, actually. You, you are, we are going to have uh, the possibility to um, deal with hardware in a way, in a way that is very similar uh, to what we do today with software. And this is, has been foreseen by this guy, uh, the creator of the Fab Lab concept. Uh, I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with the concept of Fab Labs? There are a few, but we'll get into this in, in a while. So uh, this, this guy is, uh, is the um, creator of the Center for Bit and, Bits and Atoms at the MIT. It's called Neil Geschenfeld. And that's what, what he's foreseeing. He's foreseeing a moment in which we will be able to program matter, in a way. So you, in a way, similar to how you program code today. Tomorrow you will be able to program objects. And that's happening already. This is something that happened last year, uh, last um, December in uh, Cornell University. These guys were able to print for the first time with a 3D printer. They put together a working piece of electronics. And it's actually a um, loudspeaker. Uh, they, they've been able to print both the circuitry inside the loudspeaker and the loudspeaker itself. So it's plastic plus electronics all together printed by a machine starting from a digital design. This is happening, as I said, into the Fab Labs. Fab Labs are labs. Uh, um, they um, actually are uh, built around a set of machines, con computer controlled machines, that ha are able to, to fabricate open digital designs. So you have a 3D printer, you have a laser cutter, that's a machine with a computer controlled machine that can cut stuff thanks to a laser or you have CNC routers that can uh, mill uh, hood and you know, cut it into pieces, the one that is used for wiki house, for example. So all these machines are, um, this set of machines are used to fabricate stuff starting from digital designs. That's called digital fabrication. And Fab Lab comes from fabrication laboratory. And the, the, the beautiful things uh, around Fab Labs is that they are, they are based on a model, in a way. So basically, you have, uh, you have a um, set of machine that is common to all these labs. And uh, the idea is that these labs can interoperate together. They can work together on projects. And they can develop open source projects that can be built all over the world in, in, in a lab, because all the labs have the same machines. So it's pretty powerful. And it's so powerful that uh, this, uh, set, this group of uh, laboratories is growing very fast. I, I don't know if you noticed uh, what's, that, uh, what's that ratio. It's a Muro, actually. So as you can imagine, uh, it means that it's growing very, very fast in an exponential, in an exponential way. Uh, it's growing so fast, not just in numbers, but also in, uh, in culture, I would say. Um, so basically, um, this is what's going to happen in Barcelona this year. Uh, we will, uh, there will be a huge conference, the 10th uh, conference of uh, the Fab Labs, and will be about the Fab City. So the Fab City, it's a concept uh, developed in Barcelona uh, that, see, uh, that actually see the city as getting back as a manufacturing hub, as a production hub. So uh, you, we will probably have cities um, to have a say in the manufacturing and, and production process very soon because of uh, these laboratories that are popping out. Just in Barcelona, you have 10 of them, uh, or eight of them right now. But the program is to have one for each uh, um, part of the city, I would say. So 
that's what's going to happen. And Fab Labs are distributed all over the world. You have several one also here. In th this is Fab Lab Firenze, but there are lots of uh, Fab Labs around. There is one called Fab Lab uh, Contea. I don't see the guys over there. Uh, that is pretty near in the, in, in the, in the countryside, really near here. But they are popping out everywhere. So what's going to happen is that in these places, we are going to um, get manufacturing back into cities and into communities. Uh, this has been, uh, this you know, movement about fab labs is happening in parallel with all this big movement about uh, do-it-yourself and makers. You probably know uh, Massimo Banzi very well. Uh, you know probably also Dale Dogerty, that is the director of Make and the inventor of Maker Faire. Uh, Maker Faire was last year for the first time in Italy, in Rome, uh, the European Maker Faire, and was so big that we had, uh, in three days, we had like 35,000 uh, persons attending. So the first year, uh, in a city like Rome, with no big tradition of making, actually we had almost uh, 35,000 people, so it's pretty impressive in terms of you know, engagement that is maker thing is creating into people. And uh, this, um, you know, this push to make stuff, it's also pushing people to understand how stuff works. And they are, try they are starting to, you know, to get also to repair stuff, to understand, to, to uh, I don't know what to say, but to uh, disassemble things and uh, re-put it together because they need to understand how, how this works. And, all this process is transforming user, passive users, into citizens. Uh, this project is called Smart, Citi Smart Citizen. It's a, process that, it's a project that uh, born at F Barcelona Fab Lab, again. Uh, and it's an IoT uh, board that, uh, in, together with a backend, can be used to monitor um, like open data flows coming from server, from sensors, and especially has been used in Barcelona and all over Europe to track uh, quality of the air and to store it online so that everybody can check. But it's also been used by this uh, open source Beehives uh, project that uh, was launched like a few months ago. Uh, these guys tried to do a open source um, beehive, actually. So the beehive, it's, uh, the, the, uh, as you probably know, it's, uh, I don't know what to say, in, in, in Italian, it's the alveare of the, l'alveare delle api. And you can actually have this, uh, this uh, board, this smart citizen board, inside the, the, the beehive. And this board will uh, monitor the quality of the um, uh, colony, of the bee colony. As you probably know, the bees right now are under um, treat, so we have a little bit of a problem because bees are responsible to, uh, to, you know, to pollinization of lots of uh, several vegetables. So if we lost bees, we are going to, to lose a lot of food. And so these guys created this project just to make it possible for people to build from an open digital design, a, bee, a beehive, put a, a board, a smart citizen board inside, and just start a, a, a massive citizen science project to monitor the, the quality of the colony. So this project can, be, can, can have a lot of impact, and indeed, they, they have been able to raise, uh, I think, more than $100,000, so several times the target that they had. These are the beehives. So this maker thing is getting so huge that uh, if you look at the, just at the books, uh, in 2009, Cory Doctorow made a novel about that, and in last year, Chris Anderson made a business book out of that. So that's the, you know, the process. And it's so, it's so clear that uh, we are starting to see these kind of books, like you know, the O'Reilly books on, 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 on code, you know probably more than me. And we are seeing happening also, uh, we are seeing uh, coming up also these kind of books that uh, teach people how to become a maker and, and make a, a living out of that. Um, th this is what's happening in the UK, for example. If you look at the numbers uh, in the last uh, couple of years, in the UK we had a lot more uh, 
uh, artisans uh, creating small companies, like one-person companies, thanks to the access all to, of, to all these tools to create stuff and sell it online. And so, um, actually, this make a movement is having an impact on, on opportunities for people and, and it's creating jobs in a way. So, it's so important. And we are seeing also things like uh, like this happening in Italy, like this is low D, it's a connector between designers and existing uh, workshops for fabrication, like wooden shops or, I don't know, you, you, you probably have a lot of them also near, near your house, uh, I don't know, people that used to make furniture and now they don't because there is the IKEA, but with this uh, what we are going to see is a renaissance of artisanal approach to production. Uh, you probably know Make Tank as well. Uh, it's a f uh, f uh, project born in Florence. It's on a similar path. And you, for sure, you know Kickstarter. Kickstarter is it's it's going to be the it's going to be the bigger enabler of uh, of this new approach of things. Um, I've, I've been financing for one billion uh, dollar in last year. And uh, on platforms that are similar to that, like Indiegogo, we have been looking at uh, Italian projects doing big numbers like this. This is a um, project from two students from uh, Milan Politecnico, and uh, it was able to raise $600,000. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. You know, there is a lot of opportunity over there. So w when people start doing things together, they care less about intellectual property. And actually, what's going to happen, what's happening already, it's that creation is becoming a cooperative uh, uh, process. We are transforming it in, into co-creation. And actually, as, again, what's happening is also that the sides of production that you need to make it something possible, it's, it's shrinking a lot. So maybe 10 years ago, you, you need to have a, a huge audience to create one product because you need industrial processes, you need to do tooling, you have uh, investments needed, and right now you don't need it anymore. And what's happening is that you are almost able to create unique pieces you know, for yourself, or maybe you can create 1,000 and sell it to a, a very small niche of customers. So you can create your own business around a small niche of uh, uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, fans actually. Okay. So, what happens is that when you when you build, build things in this way, in this collaborative way, uh, people underst understood that uh, the competitive advantage of uh, patenting things or or, th or things like that is actually is actually just a break on innovation. So, if you get rid of uh, of, of your competitive advantages, like I said, patents or uh, maybe special processes, and you just start uh, creating innovation on top of a shared pool of knowledge, uh, what you happen is that you are faster, you are more able to innovate, and your business is actually um, less dangerous in a way. So you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot lose your patent or maybe uh, someone else came up with something more cool and you just lose l your competitive advantage. If you build on something shared, uh, what, you, what you do is that you enjoy a lot of uh, distributed and collaborative innovation. So you can focus yourself in adding value on top of a shared pool of, uh, of, tool, of tools or knowledge. So this approach has been uh, fueling uh, like tens of projects. I mentioned in few here, like OpenRAW, it's an open source uh, underwater robot. Uh, Protei, that it's um, doing open source uh, sailing. OpenPilot, it's about drones. Uh, this is pretty cool, this is called OpenDesk, and it's an open source furniture um, uh, marketplace. Uh, so you can see, this is a, an open design, you can download it from the web and, and build it. Actually, if I don't go wrong, FabLab Firenze built lots of them for the FabLab. And the, the, the interesting thing of OpenDesk is that you, you also have a marketplace. So what's going to happen is that you can publish your design on OpenDesk, and OpenDesk is becoming like a collective brand, in a way, an open source brand, okay? So we have seen also uh, 
bolder approaches to open fabrication and open design. This is open source ecology pro, uh, pro project founder, Martin Jakubowski. And um, as you probably know, he's trying to build 50 industrial machines in open source, uh, ranging from uh, tractors uh, to, I don't know, uh, mo engines or carts or uh, torch tables or brick compressor. So uh, lots of machines that you can use to actually build other machines or maybe build a house or maybe, you know, create a, like a, an agriculture uh, site. Uh, this is the uh, percentage of uh, completion of all these machines. As you can see, uh, we are uh, neither half the way, but uh, uh, there's a lot of work done, and uh, uh, some some machines are pretty mature, especially the the CB press. It's a brick press. It can be used to 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 compress heart into bricks that you can use to build houses, and uh, also the power cube. It's a cube with an engine inside that you can use to to power uh, both tractors or, or the machines. I'm going to m move a little bit faster because uh, I think we have just a few minutes. So this is open structure. It's about a way of designing things using a um, common uh, interface, like a grid that you can use to put pieces together. And uh, thanks to open structure, we are, um, uh, you can design things that are modular and you can reuse uh, uh, several times. For example, if you look at this, uh, this part can be duplicated and maybe I've seen, I've seen this being used, uh, put together into a suite case. So it's kind of, you know, kind of modular. And this is a kitchen that they designed with the same approach. So what are we seeing is that uh, interfaces are, are coming up. Arduino, it's a, it's a, um, pretty much a famous interface. So if you design something today in IoT, you cannot really get rid of Arduino because it's so huge that it has become an interface. So you, you can do innovation or just under the interface or over the interface, but you're not going to create another Arduino, actually. So that's the, the, the meaning. If you look at, the, you know, at this, it's exactly this. This is Arduino, in a way. So in a way that is similar to what happened into mobile, for example, with Android, that established itself as an open interface so that now Chinese manufacturers can create phones uh, very easily because they don't, really know, they don't really need to know how operating system works. They just use Android. In a similar way, uh, Google is now uh, moving forward with this project that is building a foundation for a shared uh, infrastructure to build phones and consumer electronics. And it's a modular open source hardware design for computer electronics made of uh, components, as you can see. This is going to be open source. And as you can see, you can, you see this is a phone which you can plug modules. And the idea is that you just create the basis, the foundation, and then hundreds of players will be able to create every single module of the phone. So maybe the camera or the display or the, I don't know, the audio. And recently we have seen brands like Sennheiser and Toshiba getting interested into this project. So it's getting huge again very soon. Uh, this is part of the concept. It's, it's about customizing with 3D printing the covers and part of the phone. And actually the interesting thing is 3D system that is a giant of uh, 3D printing is going to be partner of this project and will print all the modules, including also the electronics, as, as we have seen before with the loudspeaker. So this is another example. It's an approach very similar that uh, I'm working with this company as a part of the team, and we are using the similar approach for vehicles. So it's not just about phones. It's going to be used also for carts. And the interesting thing is that we are building a process, uh, thanks, to do, thanks to that, you can build the, 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 the car in a different way. You just build the kit, and the kit gets uh, um, assembled locally. So this is just to explain you that uh, what we are seeing, thanks to open source hardware and uh, open innovation, it's the, the, the rise of platforms. So. Um, products that are designed for communities, not just for single users, in which you have uh, several players, it, 
that interact. Maybe one player can create one piece, another player can create another piece, and together they can create a product. And all these, I'm, I'm going to, to be very fast in the, in the last part, but all this is creating a very dynamic market that is pushing us towards complexity in a way. And as you, as you probably know, all this complexity is putting a little a bit of pressure on top of us. And because you know, all this digitalization, all this interaction that we are seeing, uh, it's, it's pu push, pushing us towards um, this kind of innovation that we cannot really control. So uh, thanks to uh, robotics, for example, and uh, automation, this is Watson, you probably know, it's an IBM uh, artificial in intelligent project. We are, we are seeing an innovation that is uh, happening uh, if, in a, mostly on efficiency of processes. And this is actually uh, canceling a lot of jobs, for example. And as you can see, we, are, we have been seeing a lot of pressure also on top of, uh, of these kind of uh, big brands of uh, technology. And at the end, we have a, uh, right now a situation in which uh, all the um, all the, all the world is subject to uh, a lot of uh, friction between big brands in technology and people. And thanks to, you know, uh, all this also happens in a context in which um, the climate change and the impacts we have seen in, in, on, uh, on uh, ecology are pretty much huge. And that's why uh, this new approach to business based on open businesses, on uh, zero marginal cost production processes empowered by IoT, open data, digital distributed fabrication, are really being a pro uh, something, something that can be like a promise for solutions. So this is the last book made by Jeremy Rifkin. You probably know this guy. And actually, the promise that we have, uh, we have in front of us is that an, an open approach to this kind of production can be really a solution uh, for building businesses that are long-lasting and then can last uh, for centuries, not just for a few years. And we are going to build, uh, as you know, I, I mentioned the OS vehicle. Uh, we are going to build businesses that are uh, multi-stakeholders. So actually, when we build, the, for example, when we build the open source car, uh, we build a car that can be built locally from uh, local uh, assemblers. So we don't do everything by ourselves. We leave room for people to make profits and be part of this value chain. So the promise is uh, to switch from uh, closed economics, where you have a manufacturer that creates a product and people that consume, to an open economy where everybody can create part of the product and together they can create a platform and can create a, com a community innovation. And these are the real you know, promises of this, especially to have a local, uh, an economy that is strongly local, made of global interaction, but where you can create uh, value locally, so like jobs or opportunities for people on local economies. That's all. I tried to put together everything in 40 minutes, but uh, it was maybe, maybe too much. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.